This is Bloomberg Crypto, a daily Bloomberg iHeart podcast. And I'm Stacey Marie Ishmael, Managing Editor of Crypto for Bloomberg News. It's Wednesday, November 30th. We're just going to keep saying this. News moves fast in crypto. To help us stay on top of it, today we're going to talk about some of the pivotal, but maybe even slightly less well-known to you players in crypto, many of whose names all begin with G. Why G? I have no idea, but it is a strong letter. Joining me today to discuss Genesis, Galaxy, and even Gemini is Bloomberg reporter Yuichi Yang. I think the centralized players recognize the need to provide more transparency just so that they can convince people that they're a legitimate business and Mm -hmm. they are not misusing your fund. Yuichi, welcome back to the podcast. Have you been getting a lot of sleep? Ah, that's a great question. Not as much as I hope to. This past few weeks has been crazy ever since the collapse of FTX happened, which nobody really saw it coming. Before we jump into some of the people who've been affected or may be affected by the collapse of FTX, remind our listeners who you are and what you cover. I am Yue Qi Yang, and I'm a crypto market structure reporter at Bloomberg in New York. And I cover crypto exchanges, including Binance, FTX, and Coinbase. So all of the people that have a lot of stuff going on right now. But in addition to covering the exchanges, you have also, along with some of our colleagues, been reporting on a lot of different kinds of crypto companies that have in the past couple of weeks been, you know, making it clear that they're affected in big and small ways by the fallout from FTX. One of the things that I've noticed is there are a lot of companies in crypto that have like really similar names to each other. And there's some that we cover that all begin with G. One of them is Genesis. And they have really, in the past couple of weeks, come to people's attention alongside Gemini, another G, (laughs) and, you know, a few other folks in that area. Can you just share with our listeners what are some of the things that have been happening in the reporting that you've been doing on them? The crypto space, there are two companies, starting with the the letter G, that are highly critical in terms of the, the role that they play in the market space. One is Genesis, um, another is Galaxy Digital, and both of them are institutional facing only, which means that they're not really household name for people outside of the crypto industry, but they're essentially providing financial services similar to what Wall Street is in finance in the crypto space. And recently, the collapse of FTX really shed a light on the business model of some of these companies, especially with Genesis, because they're also caught in the contagion effect from FTX. Now, how and why are they caught in the contagion? So, you know, you mentioned they provide financial services. Like, what are some of the ways that companies like Genesis and Galaxy are exposed to the collapse of FTX? So Genesis is one of the earliest and biggest lenders in the crypto industry. And what they do is that they provide lending to crypto players in the space. Mm -hmm. And as we know, the lenders have been hit hard in the current collapse with the drop of prices. There's question about the level of collateralization that's widely accepted in the industry. And even though Genesis is an institutional company, because they provide such a central role in providing lending to the space, some of the retail-facing products, such as Gemini Earn product, is in essence supported by Genesis. And this means that for retail users who use the Gemini crypto exchange, when they opt into this yield product, which means they can deposit their crypto and get, say, 8% yield from the product, the back end of it is supported by Genesis because what Gemini does is essentially pairing retail users who wanted to get yield from their deposits with lenders like Genesis, who is paying out the yield. Got it. So here we have another G, Gemini. So you've got Gemini, Genesis, Galaxy. Now, 
Genesis, as you mentioned, is this pivotal lender in the crypto space. And one of the challenges that they've had is this is not their first crisis. They lent money to Three Arrows Capital, now collapsed, another bankrupt hedge fund. They lent $2.4 billion to Three Arrows Capital. You mentioned collateralization earlier, but Three Arrows had put up about half as much of that in collateral. So they had an overall exposure of $1.2 billion. What happened to that exposure and how does that kind of relate to Genesis's parent company, DCG? So Genesis was the biggest creditor to Three Arrows when Three Arrows blew up. So this is really a one-two punch for Genesis. They were just recovering from Three Arrows' loss. After that, they had this new generation of leadership. Their CEO, Michael Morrow, departed and they had new top C-suite executives and they laid off people as well. So they were really trying to restructure their business and recover from the hit. And then just a few months into it, now we have the FTX collapse. And this time, it seems that they're being hit pretty hard, given that it just came on the heel of the earlier damage. And the parent company, DCG, Digital Currency Group, is a crypto conglomerate founded by Barry Silbert. And they are the one who, again, stepped in to help out with Genesis, this time with their FTX exposure. They injected capital over 100 million into Genesis when Genesis realized that it has some of its money stuck on the FTX platform. But it seems like this is not enough to fully sustain the business. And as we have reported, Genesis has been in talks for emergency fundraising to raise over $1 billion during the past few days. And they have told investors that if they can't get that money, they're at risk of entering bankruptcy. What are some of the expectations that people have for crypto right now? It's like, clearly, there's no evidence that Bitcoin is going back to $65,000 anytime soon. But at the same time, you don't really see a lot of people saying, well, everything's going to zero. We seem to be in an in-between place. Like, what is the vibe you're getting from your reporting? I think the series of blowups and failures at major companies in the crypto space is going to lead to major market structure changes in crypto. And then one big one is really the lending business in crypto. We are going to see fewer lenders who accept under-collateralized or even uncollateralized loans. Some of them just had to shut down because they're suffering from these losses. And on the other hand, DeFi is becoming a bright spot because with DeFi, you have the transparency and in theory, you can track data on chain. And that's one part that people in the industry are expecting to grow and to become more dominant going forward in the crypto space. But then at the same time, we also have regulatory uncertainty when it comes to either centralized players such as lenders or exchanges or decentralized players, which we call DeFi. So I think there's just market forces that are reshaping the market structure, especially when it comes to the type of lenders that are surviving in the industry. But then there are also regulatory forces that will come into play as well. In other words, difficult to tell (laughs) because, you know, you're describing a series of forces that are both working against and for each other. For instance, we're really, really hearing from a lot of folks that we're talking to this idea of it's not that crypto failed, it's that centralized crypto players failed, right? Like that's that's a very strong drumbeat that's coming from one particular element of the market. And then over in the side of DeFi, you know, we've had some pretty interesting types of blowups in DeFi at the same time, right? You Whether it's billions of dollars worth of hacks, whether it's questions around the legality of certain types of DAOs, whether it's even though you do have this transparency, it still appears to be very possible for the dynamics of these things to not exactly be what you are expecting. So you still you lose your money. There's a risk profile question of as interest rates continue to rise. Do you need to be taking fairly substantial risks to get that 8% yield? Can you just like put money in a bank account instead? So definitely an interesting time. But just to go back to this idea of no need for centralized lenders, 
what the lenders themselves will say and what other folks who work in the more centralized part of the market will say is they bring kind of clarity and ease of use and a better user experience than you can necessarily get from DeFi, right? If you are trying to have somebody who will pick up the phone when you have a question, having a centralized lender seems to be the way forward. Are you seeing any evidence that instead of it being these extremes of completely anonymous, decentralized protocol where your help desk is like a Discord channel and major centralized player with like expensive offices in Manhattan. Is there something emerging in the middle at all? I think there's this effort among centralized platforms such as Binance that has been pushing to disclose more of the proof of user funds, for example. There, some of them are disclosing the blockchain addresses of their customer funds. So I think the centralized players recognize the need to provide more transparency just so that they can convince people that they're a legitimate business and mm-hmm. they are not misusing your fund, which people in the industry can no longer take it for granted. I think one helpful way that I've told to think of these centralized players, such as centralized lenders, is really that they are just lenders, period. Even though product that they're dealing with is crypto, mm-hmm. the the back end and operation of their business is nothing related to blockchain. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes it's run on Excel sheet. It is the communications are done through these social media channels. Therefore, they are really not following the original ethos of crypto, which is for everyone to be able to track through blockchain the transfer of value and then for people to be able to verify things publicly and remove the need to trust an opaque player. So I think, in a way, given the series of failures in the space, the centralized players are facing consequences because they're not following strictly the original intent of blockchain, which is to be open and transparent. Coming up, we'll be right back with more from Bloomberg reporter Yuichi Yang. If I think back to 2008, where you had a very similar set of concerns around, can you trust that somebody knows what their positions are? How are they marking these assets? Are there market prices they can get for these assets? One of the concerns that centralized players had about being more transparent was this idea that people could like take advantage of knowing what your positions are. They could potentially front run you or, you know, squeeze you depending on like where you were playing or even, and I remember this concern about when the banks were all getting stress tested, that if your stress test came back and showed that you were highly stressed, then that might, you know, precipitate a run on that particular bank. Are you seeing any similar criticisms of these attempts at transparency in crypto that we saw on Wall Street, you know, a while ago? I think there's this recognition within the crypto space that financial regulation makes sense. There's a reason that they're put in there by regulators. We had an editor who joked that financial regulators have never been so flattered (laughs) after seeing the the series of crypto blowups because it it shows what happens in the market when you do not have these protections that that people have learned from their past mistakes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think it is interesting like so searching period for for crypto native folks too on one hand the whole industry started when they are trying to run away from some of the established institutions and regulations but then on the other hand they are really suffering from the consequences from that yeah what an interesting time to be a regulator you know you're sort of writing your performance review being like look at all the things that we prevented from happening over here just as a kind of a, a closing question I have covered financial markets for a long time, and I am used to kind of a breakneck pace of breaking news. But even by historical standards, the speed at which things in crypto happen is genuinely astonishing. When you're talking to the sources that you have that aren't sleeping much either, like what is their impression of why things are moving so quickly? Is there something unique to this asset class? Is it because it's such a small industry and everybody knows and is exposed to each other? Like, do they have a take on why 
on Tuesday, everything's fine. On Thursday, everybody's bankrupt. I would say that social media plays a huge part in this because everything is being played out in real time on social media. Mm -hmm. When FTX got into trouble, CZ and Sam Bankman Free were announcing their deals real time on Twitter. And that's how people find out the issue of liquidity crunch at FTX. So I think in the past few weeks, every day there's Twitter space being held that are hours long and there's citizen journalism effort on Twitter as well. So I think the pace is very fast because in a way that everyone is crowdsourcing information and sharing information at the same time on social media. But that also comes with the challenge of verifying this information, Mm -hmm. at least for us reporters, because there are a lot of rumors being put out as well. Interesting that none of this is happening on Mastodon yet, but we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Thank you very much, Yuichi. Pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. You can find more of Yuichi's reporting on the Bloomberg Terminal and on Bloomberg.com. And of course, you can check out our twice-weekly newsletter, Bloomberg Crypto. This is Bloomberg Crypto, a daily podcast from Bloomberg and iHeartRadio. For more shows from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Send us your comments, questions, or suggestions for the show to crypto at Bloomberg.net. The supervising producer of Bloomberg Crypto is Vicky Vergolina. Our senior producer is Janet Babin. Our producers are Mohamed Farouk and Sharon Bariro. Our associate producers are Ty Butler and Moses Ondam. Desta Wonderad is our engineer. Original music by Leo Sidron. I'm Stacey Marie Ishmael. We'll be back tomorrow.